Voters in all of the province's 444 municipalities exercised their franchise yesterday. Let's find out what happened in some of the key races with our Ontario Hubmeisters. Joining us now from our studio at Confederation College in Thunder Bay, John Thompson in our Northwestern Ontario Hub. From our studio at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Claude Sharma covering the Northeast. From our studio at Western University in London, Mary Baxter in our Southwestern Ontario Hub. And from our studio at Queen's University in Kingston, David Rockney Corrigan covering Eastern Ontario. And Hubsters, it's good to have you back on TVO all together tonight for this election post-mortem extravaganza. I, I think one of the things that unites all four of your areas of the province is that uh, there were some e-voting glitches that we want to get into. Claude, why don't you take us uh, through the Sudbury experience first? All right, Steve. So Sudbury went through the Dominion voting system. And what happened was uh, yesterday for about a 90 minute span, there was a glitch in the system. So people had a tough time voting online. It backed up and people couldn't really cast their vote. So once that happened, the city clerk here in Sudbury decided with all that's happening, let's extend this voting period to the following day, Tuesday, ending today at 8 o'clock. So 24 more hours for people to vote. And this is the first time that Greater Sudbury has adopted this e-voting system. And it's been met with uh, some harsh criticism so far. So yesterday I thought it could have been a little bit hyperbolic with what was said, but after they slept on it, after I slept on it, uh, it seemed like it almost got worse today. So a lot of the mayoral hopefuls were finger pointing at uh, current mayor Brian Bigger saying that he was the one who helped vote uh, for this process to get in place. But Mayor Brian Bigger went on the offense. He said, um, this is the fault of city staff. He attacked them and so did his campaign team. But the other mayoral candidates went right after Bigger saying, uh, this is disgusting, this is a disgrace. Uh, one even calling it a democratic disaster. So uh, Brian Bigger and his team, they want to hold those, uh, they call responsible, uh, give them some accountability and they want to launch an investigation. And Steve, even one mayor candidate said, that Sudbury, because of this, is now the most corrupt city in Canada. I'm not even going to go there. What I am going to go, where I am going to go, is reading the statement that Dominion Voting put out to describe the situation that you've just uh, outlined. And what Dominion Voting says is voters in approximately 51 Ontario municipalities using Dominion's internet voting portal experienced slow traffic into the system. This load issue was determined to be the result of a Toronto-based server placing an unauthorized limit on incoming voting traffic that was roughly one-tenth of the system's designated bandwidth. Our company was unaware of this issue until our municipal customers and their voters reached out to us for assistance or to share complaints. That's the official explanation. John, did it have an impact in your part of the province? It didn't very much. Uh, Thunder Bay had some delay, uh, but that was mostly due to surnames and given names being confused uh, between the, the interface between the local software and the, and the mothership, if you will. Um, Ignace uh, went until about 2 o'clock in the morning last night before they had results, but there wasn't electronic voting there. Uh, there were 17 candidates, and all of those ballots were counted by hand. David, you spoke to a professor at Queen's University today who had some feedback on this issue. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, so I spoke to Kathy Brock. She's a professor here at Queen's University's School of Policy Studies. And, you know, she acknowledged that uh, these online voting problems were significant. Uh, if it were, in fact, 51 of 444 municipalities that had problems, you know, that's that's a problem. Uh, but she, you know, suggested that maybe it's too soon to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, as it were. Uh, you know, we've just come too far uh, with online voting and, you know, it's clearly going to be the, the, the choice uh, for the next generation of voters. They, they want to do things online. So moving away from that uh, would probably be short-sighted. And she said, you know, it's already, you can already see its benefits on, on democracy. You know, you, it's cheaper for municipalities not to have polls open. And it's, you know, it's easier for constituents to vote. And if, you know, whatever, whatever ways of, of getting that voter turnout uh, increased is good for municipalities. Mary, anything in southwestern Ontario you want to bring our attention to? 
Well, actually, Steve, uh, most of Gray County municipalities, most of Bruce County municipalities were affected. Uh, Cambridge was affected, but not to the same degree. They, they extended their, their uh, deadline to, I think, about 10 o'clock last night. But the other ones uh, are all, their deadline is tonight at 8. But I was talking with a number of residents today over Facebook and Twitter about what they thought about this situation. And uh, things landed just about where you would think. There were people saying, well, you know, it's a glitch. We just need time to work out these glitches, that sort of thing. And others were saying, well, we should just go straight back to paper voting. I think, I think one comment that I found kind of interesting came from uh, a candidate who was running to be a councillor in Saugeen Shores. His name is Patrick Jill and he noted that uh, it points out the need for upgrading broadband in rural areas, although this problem wasn't related to that. Uh, rural areas tend to have, don't have as uh, much high-speed service and could be vulnerable to this type of situation in the future. Okay, Mary, while you've got the floor, I want to stay with you because you actually, right now, are in ground zero of one of the most interesting democratic experiments that was happening anywhere in the province of Ontario last night, and that is... People didn't just vote once for their choice of candidate. They had a ranked ballot, and they voted for their first choice, second choice, third choice, and all the way down for mayor and all the councillors. How did it work? Well, I don't think there's dancing in the streets today, but I, I think that there's a, a lot of uh, satisfaction with how it went. Uh, uh, we have a new mayor after 16, no, sorry, 14 rounds of counting. It's Ed Holder, and he's a former Conservative MP, actually. Uh, and the, the, the city got out all of the 14, there's 14 wards that they had to count. They got the results out roughly around noon today for them. And then shortly afterwards came the, the uh, count for the, the mayor. So considering that it's a new system, it really went smoothly. That was one of the points that uh, Jerry McCartney, he's the, uh, uh, of the London Chamber of Commerce made, was just how smoothly it went. And he noted London is a really good place to test out these things because it's not really, uh, attached to a county, it's not attached to a larger um, urban area, and it's, but it's a city of a certain size that makes a really good test subject for this. Hmm. And of course the way it works is the, the lowest ranked candidate drops off the ballot, that candidate's votes are redistributed among the remaining candidates, which is why it took 14 rounds before Ed Holder finally got 50% plus 1% of the vote. Uh, the theory is that if you get the majority of the votes, you've got more legitimacy. Anyway, David, I want to go to you next because I gather the whole idea of rank balloting uh, was on the ballot in Kingston last night. What happened with that? So the uh, voters of Kingston uh, did vote for ranked balloting to be uh, the, the, the way of voting in 2022. However, uh, in the in the small print in the in the lead up and in the decision to put this on the ballot, uh, the vote actually required 50 percent voter turnout, uh, and Kingston did not reach that. I think it'll probably end up being closer to 40, uh, and, and what that means is that it's non-binding. So even though Kingston voted 60 to 40 in favor of of ranked ballot voting, uh, it's not binding and it will go to uh, to council. Uh, I have uh, seen uh, some other local media reporting here today that the the elected mayor, the incumbent mayor, re-elected mayor Brian Patterson, uh, is committed to you know uh, heeding to the wishes of, of the Kingston voters. So it's likely that this will move forward, uh, but it's not binding and will go to uh, to council. And I know Cambridge voted 56 percent in favor of it as well. But do they also have the fine print requiring a certain level of turnout? As far as I know, they did, uh, and uh, they, they also, like Kingston, required 50 percent, and they didn't, reach, they didn't reach that in terms of voter turnout, uh, so it remains to be seen. There was some media reporting today that it was going to be spiked altogether, but I think it will, uh, like Kingston, uh, go to council where they will decide what to do with it. Okay. John, bring us up to date on the mayor's race, because uh, that was a real squeaker last night. Tell us what happened. It was. Uh, Bill Morrow, the former uh, Thunder Bay Atacokan MPP, is Thunder Bay, will be Thunder Bay's next mayor. Um, he won over a couple of, uh, a couple of incumbent councillors and, um, 
and he went, he ran on a on the basis of uh, solving crime problems in Thunder Bay and dealing with the economy. Uh, those are both serious issues. Uh, uh, the rest of council followed somewhat of a trend of the rest of northwestern Ontario. The uh, there were a couple of trends. One of which is that about ten years ago we saw young people begin to get involved uh, in politics. Uh, the first wave of those has broken through. Uh, so there are you know people in their early forties and late thirties on council and uh, in Kenora, Fort Francis, uh, Thunder Bay. Uh, the other phenomenon was the sort of back to the future concept uh, where past councillors have returned. Uh, and that was also a factor in Thunder Bay, uh, Dryden, uh, Kenora and Fort Francis. And, and so it looks like there was a great deal of change in northwestern Ontario, uh, but but really a lot of it is going back to what there once was. And you should just remind us why the previous mayor, the incumbent mayor, didn't run again. Of course, Keith Hobbs, uh, the the mayor from 2010 to 2018, uh, is uh, will stand trial for extortion, uh, along with his wife Marissa. Uh, a date will be set for that at the end of October. Hmm. Okay, Claude, I want to bring you in right now because as part of our pre-election coverage, you did examine the issue of female representation in municipal politics across the province, and I wonder whether you can come to any far-reaching conclusions today about whether we saw much change in that department. Well, Steve, the focus of my piece was uh, on Northern Ontario, and I just give a little bit of a background of the 36 people who ran in the five major northern Ontario cities, Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Timmins, Sudbury, and uh, North Bay, is that two of the 36 were women. Now, if you look at how women were represented in this election, uh, some good news on some fronts. If you look at Algonquin Highlands, that is the one of maybe the first all-female council with one female mayor and uh, four of councillors being women as well. Ottawa did not so bad. They saw uh, an increase from four to seven. Not close to parity, but uh, some accomplishments there. North Bay had one councillor who was female last time around. This time they have two, but they were the two highest vote getters. So good news there. It's kind of a one step forward, two step backwards, because if you look at uh, North Bay four and eight years ago, they had three women on council. So we went from three to one back to two, but again, those two were the highest vote getters. And in Espanola, uh, nearby Sudbury, uh, a new female mayor there, and four of the seven uh, make up uh, council of women, so uh, gender parity in favor of women in Espanola. Since still numbers are coming in, uh, we'll see what happens, uh, of course, here in Sudbury, because again, 24 hour extension on voting online uh, in my neck of the woods. Right. David, I want to bring you in at this point because I did notice during the campaign you wrote a piece on the large number of municipal candidates who were going to win without a contest. Acclamations, they call them in the business. And let's just run through some of the numbers here. Uh, Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up? Acclamations in Ontario. Believe this, 120 of 444 municipalities have acclaimed their next head of council. That is more than a quarter. 536 out of more than 3,000 total council positions were acclaimed. That's about 16%. And 26 municipalities around Ontario had their entire council acclaimed. No election, no competition. They just won. Uh, as you hunted around for comments on this, David, uh, what did people say in terms of what that says about the state of democracy in the province of Ontario? Uh, well, I will say, without uh, without a contested election, I guess there were there were no chances for any online voting problems. Uh, <laughs> but but besides that, uh, I think what I was interested in, and it started with a town called uh, a village in, uh, called Castleman, which is sort of close to the uh, the Quebec border. And in that town, uh, the there were three candidates running for mayor, and on the very last day uh, of nominations being opened, two of them dropped out. Uh, and you know, essentially, the 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 incumbent mayor, who's 76 years old and had been uh, in local politics for a very long time, he he literally handed a key of to the city over to uh, to one of his challengers and said, uh, I, "I trust you to to run the city." And he, with that, he dropped out, and there was uh, no election for mayor. And it, it got me thinking about what kind of effect uh, this has on, on democracy. And you know, you you went through some numbers there, and I, I should say that we're not at a 
you know, any kind of democratic crisis in Ontario. Uh, you look at Quebec and uh, of their roughly 8,000 positions that were up uh, in, in, in municipal elections last year, about 55 percent of those, so way, way uh, more than, than in, in Ontario. So uh, if you're looking for uh, some comfort, there may be some, some there. But I was interested in the question of, of democracy and, 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 and what happens in these communities. And, you know, I spoke to some municipal pol politics experts, and one of them said to me, you know, Democracy sometimes works different in smaller towns and, you know, in, in often case in a, in a place where there's 3,000 people, uh, everybody knows everybody and there's a sense that if you have an issue, you can take it right to your councillor. In Toronto, for instance, that's not going to be the case. You know, sometimes the, in these, they, they represent more than 110,000 people. So that was where I was coming from. Uh, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting conversation, uh, but we're not reaching a, a crisis point in Ontario with that. Okay. In our remaining moments here, and Mary, I'll get you to start on this, and we'll uh, keep going for as much as time permits. You know, a big part of what municipal politicians do, and the mayors in particular, is negotiate with the provincial government to get more money, to get programs, to get whatever. And, of course, there's all sorts of talk now about whether or not the people who got elected last night, uh, you know, are going to have an easier or tougher time doing that. Uh, perhaps John in Thunder Bay it might be tougher, given that it's an ex-liberal MPP who's now the mayor. Uh, Mary, I don't know. You tell me. In London, Ontario, they got a populist conservative who just got elected mayor. We got a populist conservative who's the premier of the province. Are people assuming things will work better going forward? I would think that this might be one of the underlying reasons behind Ed Holder's popularity. And he's not the only uh, uh, former conservative MP who's been elected in our area. Uh, down in, um, in St. Thomas, uh, we saw Joe Preston also elected. So it seems it, it's also kind of interesting when you, when you look at the strong NDP presence in, in London, for instance, and then now we've got both at the municipal level and then at the provincial level uh, that, that conservative uh, um, element that is, you know, they're able to talk back and forth. So it could mean good news for the region. John, last word to you. Any concerns in northwestern Ontario that electing a Liberal MPP might not be the way to find favour at Queen's Park with a populist Conservative Premier? It's, it's less of a partisan issue than a practical issue. The municipalities across northwestern Ontario are telling me that the, the biggest issues that are perceived to be municipal issues are housing, homelessness, crime, drug abuse. Uh, the municipalities have neither the money to address those programs nor the constitutional authority. And so they're going to be expecting or hoping for a very strong partner in, uh, at Queen's Park, uh, regardless of, of the partisan backgrounds of the people representing us at both levels. And Claude, I can't ask you that question because you don't know who the mayor is yet. But hopefully before we get off the air nope. tonight, we might. Uh, that'd be good to know. Uh, Hubsters, it's good to be on with you again here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your contributions. Until next time. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.